This morning's scripture is taken from 2 Chronicles chapter 34, beginning at verse 14, and I'll be reading through to the end of the chapter. The book of the law found. While they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest, found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. Hilkiah said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan. Then Shaphan took the book to the king and reported to him, your officials are doing everything that has been committed to them. They have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the supervisors and workers. Then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkah, Ahiakam, son of Shaphan, Abdon, son of Micah, Shaphan the secretary, and Aziah the king's attendant. Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the remnant in Israel and Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that is poured out on us because those who have gone before us have not kept the word of the Lord. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written in this book. Hilkiah and those the king had sent with him went to speak to the prophet Huldah, who was the wife of Shalom, son of Tokath, the son of Hazra, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. She said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, tell the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people. All the curses written in the book that has been read in the presence of the king of Judah. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all their hands have made. My anger will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before God, when you heard what he spoke against this place and its people, and because you humbled yourself before me and tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Now I will gather you to your ancestors and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster 
I am going to bring on this place and on those who live here. So they took her answer back to the king. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, and the Levites, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by his pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul and to obey the words of the covenant written in this book. Then he had everyone in Jerusalem and Judah pledged themselves to it. The people of Jerusalem did this in accordance with the covenant of God, the God of their ancestors. Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all the territory belonging to the Israelites. And he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. As long as he lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Thank you, Ted. Thanks for being here. Your presence is an encouragement to the rest of us. Serendipity. I heard a man say serendipity is looking in a haystack for a needle and you discover the farmer's daughter. Another person said serendipity is look for something, find something else, and realize that what you found is more suited to your needs than what you thought you were looking for. When we make a discovery of something, we're not only looking for it, it's called serendipity. There is such a serendipity in the scripture text for today. Ted read it for you. Halkeah, the priest, found the book of the law of the Lord in the temple. It was there around 50 to 60 years. Now, you wouldn't think something as amazing as the book of the law would be lost in the temple, right in the middle of the church. But Halkeah was amazed to find it. For some reason, in some way, the book of the law of the Lord had been lost over 50 years, right in the middle of the church. The Bible was lost. One is forced to wonder, how could an item of such spiritual prominence have disappeared from the scene? How could that happen? right in the middle of the temple. What might have contributed to the loss of God's word, perhaps it was lost through neglect. Nobody was reading it anymore. Perhaps it was lost through deliberate disregard. Perhaps it was considered outdate, irrelevant, an old book. Perhaps it was lost through malicious intent. Perhaps it was lost because someone hid it to protect it from the enemies. And in time, it was just forgotten about. At any rate, it was lost then. And in many ways, places today, God's word is lost. Sometimes it's lost in many homes. It's also surprising how many homes have Bibles that they don't read. It seems to be lost in the schools. When I was in high school, we went to homeroom. The teacher read a verse of scripture, prayed for us for the whole day. And then we stood up and pledged allegiance to the flag. That's the high school I went to. That kind of influence, of course, has been lost. 
all sorts of humanistic, atheist, and immoral philosophies are freely presented and openly exposed to the school in many different ways. I think it's lost in the public life. There was a time where every courtroom in the country had a plaque of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments have been removed from every courtroom. I think it's lost in churches today. I read an article a couple of weeks ago where some churches decided they're not going to have communion anymore because it gets in the way of praise and worship and it costs too much. The same churches decide they're not going to baptize anymore. It's too much trouble, it's too much work. They'll just have a sinner's prayer. I believe when churches act that way, they've lost the Bible right in the middle of the church. When they consider the Bible uninspired and irrelevant, they've lost it. For Judah, the Bible was lost work, but thanks to Helkiah, the Bible was found. I really believe that though the find was serendipitous, it was also providential. God knew the heart of this young king and knew that this was the time to bring about revival through the relocation of the lost treasure. Though the Bible is largely lost when it's found, there is a conviction of sin when it's found. We, like Josiah, became aware of the guilt. When we find the Bible, there is a desire to know and follow God's counsel. When we find the Bible, there is hope. As David said, I faint with longing for your salvation, but I put my hope in your words. That's Psalm 119, verse 81. When the Bible is found, there's joy. David also said, your statues are many heritage forever. They are the joy of the heart. That's Psalm 119, verse 11. When the Bible is found, there is acquaintance with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. When the Bible is found, there's a spiritual freedom Jesus promised, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's John 8, verse 32. When the Bible is found, there is faith. Romans 10, verse 17 says, yet faith comes from listening to the message of the good news, the good news about Christ. Romans 10, verse 17. God is not playing hide and seek. He desires to reveal himself, his will, his plan, and his promise through the word. You with Josiah can find God's word. A Scottish woman I read about was urged by her friends to receive Jesus Christ. She refused. One friend gave her tracts, but she threw them in the fireplace. One of them fell out, and she tossed it in again. It fell out in a second time, and once more she tried to burn it. Later that day, after flames died down, she noted the track was scorched, but still not burnt. She said, surely the devil is in that paper, for it will not burn. She began to read the track, and she came under conviction of sin. Through that charred track, which contained God's word, she was led to faith in Christ. The Bible was lost to her, and then it was found. And so it's with Josiah. The Bible was lost, and then found, and then it was applied. The Bible was applied. Josiah paid close attention to what the scrolls said. He listened to the message with his mind and his heart. He not only received the word mentally and academically, but practically he put it to work. Notice how the word was applied. When the Bible was found, his heart was tender and humble enough to submit obedience to what God said. When the Bible was found, he and the people renewed the covenant God had made with Moses. They committed themselves to obedience. When the Bible was found, Josiah uprooted and banished idolatry and paganism, and everyone turned to the Lord to worship him. When we discover God's word and apply it to our own lives, good things are about to happen. When we find the Bible, ethics are changed. Honestly, integrity and trust prevail. When we find the Bible, Attitudes and values are changed. Our perspective on life is altered to fit God's promise. When we find the Bible, morals and behavior are changed. We live our lives in a manner worthy of those who claim to be Christians. When we find the Bible, homes are changed. 
Marriages are founded in God's principles. Children respect and obey their parents, and parents gently discipline their children. When the Bible is not applied, it's like a group of laborers gathered together while they sit in the tool shed. They go to the tool shed every Sunday to study better methods of agriculture. They sharpen their hoes, they grease their tractors, they go home, they return Wednesday night to study more methods of agriculture. They sharpen their hoes, they grease their tractors, they go home week after week, year after year, repeating the process, but not going to the fields to plant, cultivate or harvest. They never apply what they learn about farming. If we read the Bible, attend worship, but never put it to work, it remains a lost work. Finding the scroll in the temple was serendipity. The riches of God's word are for you now and eternity. The riches are for this life and for the next life. Josiah read the book that Helkiah discovered. He responded with repentance and humility and promised to follow God's command as it is written. The Bible, God's words to us is alive and active. We cannot know what God wants us to do if we don't read it. And even reading God's word is not enough. We must be willing to do what it says. There's not much difference between a book hidden in the temple and a book sitting on the shelf getting dust. An unread Bible is useless, as useless as a lost one. Have you found the word? Is it part of your life? Do you read it daily? Did you apply what it said? You may begin this morning as we sing, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Take it to him at his word, just to rest upon his promise and to know thus saith the Lord. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood and in simple faith to plunge beneath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace, trust him. Shall we pray? Father, may our worship be acceptable before you, that the peace that surpasses all understanding be with us as we leave this place. Help us to make a difference in the world this new week. Let our words and actions align with your word. Help us to practice what we have learned here. Bless us as we leave this place and help us to be a blessing to everyone that we meet and interact with. Help us never to forget that you're with us always. And Lord, I pray for these that are gathered here this morning. I pray they feel the gentle breeze of the Holy Spirit. Fill them full of you, Lord. Help them, guide them, direct them, heal them, lead them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm going to read the communion meditation. It's in your bulletin. The Lord's Supper. For some, the service of communion is a sleepy hour in which wafers are eaten, juice is taken, and the soul never stirs. It wasn't intended to be as such. In Matthew's account of the Last Supper, one incredible truth surfaces. Jesus is the person behind it all. He selected the place, designated the time, and set the meal in order. And at the supper, Jesus is not the served, but the servant. It is Jesus who put on the garb of a servant and washed the disciples' feet. Jesus is not portrayed as one who reclines and receives, but as the one who stands and gives. He still does. The Lord's Supper is a gift to you. The Lord's Supper is a holy invitation, a sacred sacrament bidding you to leave the chores of life 
and enter his splendor. He meets you at the table. So take the wafer that represents Jesus's body that died on the cross for us. And the juice, that is Jesus' blood, shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord God, we thank you that you meet us here at this table, and that you are with us, and you share this meal with us. We pray that you would help us be your hands and feet as we go out into the world Help us speak your love. We ask all of this through Christ, our Lord. Amen.